On the 12th of June, 1929, Anne Frank is born in Frankfurt, Germany. She is the second child of Jewish parents, Otto and Edith Frank. Her older sister is called Margot. In 1933, when Anne is three years old, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party rise to power in Germany. The Nazis, building on existing anti-Jewish sentiments, blame the Jews for many of Germany's problems. And Hitler's government soon passes laws that turn Jews into second-class citizens. As a result, many German Jews decide to leave Germany and seek refuge elsewhere. The Frank family moves to Amsterdam, the Dutch capital, where Otto Frank establishes his own business. The family settles in, leading a normal life for a number of years. But then, in May 1940, Shortly after the start of the Second World War, Nazi Germany invades the Netherlands. It installs an oppressive regime and starts isolating the Jewish population. In 1941, the situation worsens as the Nazis start to carry out raids, arresting Jewish men and transporting them to concentration camps in Nazi Germany. In July of 1942, when Margot receives a call-up notice to go and work in Nazi Germany, Otto and Edith Frank decide to take action. Having already prepared a hiding place in an empty part of Otto Frank's company building, they hurriedly move their family into the secret annex and go into hiding. Frank family is soon joined by four other Jewish people. Otto's co-worker Hermann von Pels, his wife August, and their son Peter, and one of Otto's friends, Fritz Pfeffer. It is this group of eight people who will live together in the small annex for more than two years, sharing the burden of living in hiding with the constant fear of being discovered. All this time, they are cared for by six helpers, trusted employees of Otto Frank, who supply them with food and other necessities. During this period, Anne, then a young teenager, keeps a diary, writing about her feelings and experiences in the annex, about the events taking place in their secret hiding place, its entrance hidden behind a revolving bookcase. Countless friends and acquaintances are on their way to a horrible destination. Night after night, the green or gray military vehicles drive by, ring every bell to ask if Jews live there. If so, the whole family has to go along right away. If not, they move on. No one can escape their fate unless they go into hiding.
Our hiding place has now become a true hiding place. Mr. Kugler, you see, thought it would be better to place a cupboard in front of our door. But then, of course, a cupboard unhinges that can open like a door. Now, when we want to go downstairs, we have to duck first, then jump. After three days, we were all walking around with bumps on our foreheads, because everyone kept banging their heads against the low doorway. Peter then made the door frame as soft as possible by nailing to it a cloth full of wood shavings. We'll see if it helps. Straight across from the door, a steep set of stairs. To the left, a little hallway and a room, which is to be the Frank family's living room and bedroom. Of course, we are never allowed to look out the window or go outside. During the day, we always have to walk quietly and speak softly. The people in the warehouse mustn't hear us. It weighs on me more heavily than I can say that we can never go out, and I am terribly afraid that we will be caught and executed. That, of course, is not a very pleasant prospect. We always look forward to those Saturdays, because that's when the books arrive. Normal people don't know how much books mean to someone who is locked up. Reading, studying, and the radio are our only distractions. Thank you. 
It's terrible being sick in here. Whenever I had to cough, I would crawl down deep, deep, deeper under the blankets and try to quieten my throat as gently as possible. But enough about being sick now. I'm feeling dandy again. I've grown half an inch, put on two pounds, pale and eager to learn. Our little room, with its stern walls, was very bare until now, thanks to Father, who had brought my whole collection of picture postcards and movie stars here beforehand, I have been able to treat the walls with a pot of glue and a brush, and so turn the entire room into one big picture. Writing lets me get rid of it all. My sorrow disappears, my courage is revived. But, and that's the main question, will I ever be able to write something great? Will I ever be a journalist and a writer? I hope, oh, I do so hope I will, because writing lets me register everything, my thoughts, my ideals, and my fantasies. As of yesterday, I have found something new. For instance, using a good pair of binoculars to spy on the lighted rooms of the people who live behind us. During the day, we are not allowed to open the curtains even an inch, but when it's so dark, there can be no harm in it. My hopes are fixed on the time that will come after the war. I would love to go to Paris for a year and London for a year to learn the language and study art history.
I feel bad for lying in a warm bed. While my dearest friends are out there somewhere, thrown or fallen to the ground. I even become afraid myself when I think about all those to whom I have always felt so close and who are now in the hands of the cruelest brutes who ever existed. And that only because they are Jews. Margo and Mother are on pins and needles. Shh, Father. Quiet, Otto. Shh. It's 8.30. Come here now. You can't run the water anymore. Walk quietly. These are the various cries that go out to Father in the bathroom. At the stroke of 8.30, he must be in the room. Not a drop of water, no walking, everything quiet. When there's no one in the office downstairs, everything sounds so much louder in the storeroom. I have changed, and very thoroughly too, totally and in every way. My opinions, outlook, judgment, appearance, inner life, everything has changed and, I am pleased to say, because it's true, for the better. If one climbs the stairs and opens the door at the top, one is amazed to find such a large, light and spacious room in such an old canal house. The kitchen, in other words, and also the bedroom of Mr. and Mrs. Van Pels, the common living room, dining room and study. That difference, that huge difference, is always there. One day we're laughing about the ridiculous side of being in hiding, but the next day, and for many days after that, we are afraid. You can see the fear, tension and despair on our faces.
This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a special bulletin. This is the day. The English radio set at 12 o'clock. And rightly so, this is the day. The invasion has begun. The annex in an uproar. Could it really be that the long-awaited liberation is on its way? The liberation about which we've talked so much, but that is still too lovely, too fabulous to ever come true. Could this year, this 1944, grant us victory? We don't know yet either, but the hope that springs eternal makes us brave, gives us renewed strength. During the 21 months we've been here, we have gone through quite a number of food periods. By food periods, I mean periods during which one gets nothing else to eat but a certain dish or certain vegetables. It is not nice at all to have to eat sauerkraut, for example, every day at lunch and at dinner again. But when you're hungry, there are lots of things you put up with. When you knock on his door early in the evening and hear someone quietly call out, yes, yes, then you can be sure that when you open the door, you will find him peeking out at you from between two steps of the stairs to the loft and that he will usually continue with a rather welcoming, so. His little room is, well, what is it really? I think a sort of landing on the way to the loft. Very small, very dark and very humid, but... He has made it into a real bedroom. Whenever I went upstairs to Peter's room, by daylight, I always found the atmosphere very cheerful. I watched for an opportunity to remain in the room unnoticed and to get him talking. And yesterday, that opportunity arose. Peter, by the way, has suddenly developed a mania for crossword puzzles and does nothing else these days. I helped him with it, and soon we were sitting across from each other at his table. He in the chair, me on the divan. Do you really think that father and mother would approve of me sitting on a divan with a boy, kissing? A boy of 17 and a half and a girl of almost 15? I don't really think so. But I have to rely on myself in this case. It's so peaceful and safe to lie in his arms and to dream. It is so exciting to feel his cheek against mine. It's so lovely to know that someone is waiting for me. I've reached the point where it doesn't matter much anymore whether I die or whether I live on. The world will go on spinning without me, and I can't do anything to change events anyway. I let it come and do nothing but study, and hope that things will turn out well.
I go up to the loft almost every morning to let the stuffy indoor air blow out of my lungs. This morning, when I went to the loft again, Peter was there cleaning up. He was done quickly, and while I was sitting at my favorite spot on the floor, he came over too. The two of us looked at the beautiful blue of the sky, at the bare chestnut tree with little drops glistening on its branches, at the seagulls and other birds that seemed made of silver in the sunlight, and all of that moved and touched both of us, so that we could no longer speak. That is the difficult thing these days. Ideals, dreams, lovely expectations barely rise up before being struck down by the most horrible of realities and so destroyed completely. I see how the world is gradually being transformed into a wasteland. More and more loudly, I hear the incoming thunder that will kill us too. I feel the suffering of millions of people and still, when I look at the sky, I think that all this will finally turn out for the good. That this hardness too will stop. That calm and peace will return to the world order. In the meantime, I must keep my ideals high and dry. In the days that are coming, I may actually be able to carry them out. On the morning of the 4th of August, 1944, the hope Anne is holding on to is suddenly all lost. The hiding place is discovered, and police barge into the annex, arresting everyone. The group is transferred to Auschwitz, and men and women are separated upon arrival. After two months, Anne and her sister Margot are transferred to Bergen-Belsen. The living circumstances in the camp are horrific. And in February 1945, Anne and Margot both die from illness and exhaustion, two months before the camp is liberated. Of the entire group, only Otto Frank survives the camps. When he returns to the Netherlands, he finds the annex completely ransacked. Most of Anne's writings, however, had been safeguarded after the raid by one of the helpers, Miep Hees. When it becomes clear that Anne has died, they are handed over to Otto. Upon discovering Anne wanted to publish a book about her experiences, he decides to fulfill her wish. In 1952, Diary of a Young Girl is published in English. It will become one of the most read books in the world, translated into more than 70 languages.